Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host yet again, Chris Brown. I don't know why I keep on saying that, but I will keep on saying that because that is my name. I am Chris Brown and this is my show. Um, we always love it when guests reach out to us to come on the show because we, we, we try to bring a lot of people on the show, but sometimes we overlook some people. And I'm so happy this organization reached out to come on the show because it is a subject that I want to dive more deeply into in 2022. And that is youth and politics. And we have today the founder and CEO of Youth and Politics, Zubair Hussein. Zubair, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to this. So I, I, let's start off with the age-old question. Why politics? What, what, what's fascinating about politics in your mind? So, um, Chris, it's, politics is a way <laughs> that you can actually make, you can change things. You know, like, it's like, for example, uh, if there's a policy that people don't like, politics has that power mm -hmm. to change that. Um, you know, there's diplomacy in politics, there's government in politics, there's democracy in politics. Politics is such a broad thing and inside of it, there's small, small things that make up our society. And so if we can really understand what politics is and dive deep and we can solve many of the issues that are surrounding us, like climate change, uh, that is really important to us youth right now, climate change, you know, the housing crisis. For example, my generation can't afford houses. How do we fix it? We get into politics. Stuff like that, politics is important. So when did politics uh, come into your mind? Like, I can remember the 1990 election back in Ontario. I'm originally from Ontario. So I remember that 1990 election because my family ran in that election and Bob Ray won that election. And we were like, whoa, Bob Ray just won an election, an NDP government in Ontario. So what was your first introduction to politics? Uh, I'd say um, high school. You know, we have that civics and careers class in high school in grade 10. And, uh, you know, I got to learn more about what our government is about and how, you know, how elections work and everything. And then really in grade 11 and 12, when my teacher, Mr. Carr, down in JCR, Jay Clark, where you go to high school, he really made me interested in politics by his, uh, his, yeah, his uh, talks, his lectures and his slideshows. And that just really interested me. And, you know, I was like, OK, you know what? I'm really interested in this. And I started reading more about it. And I'm like, it's so fascinating because you see the, how politics changed over time. You know, back in, in the 1920s, you had uh, farmers parties and everything. And then now it switches to like, you know, more uh, conservative democ democratic parties. And then you learn more about, you know, the different systems, for example, countries that don't have democracies. And you learn, wow, that's fascinating. I didn't know that, you know. And so that really got me into politics, I'd say, in high school, in grade 11 and 12. Now, uh, I can remember grade 11 and 12. I think I was a very uh, oddball uh, kid because as you can see behind me, if you're watching this via YouTube, if you're not, you're, you, you will probably have seen photos on social media, but I am a political nerd. I have buttons from campaigns that span across this great country of ours. And as a kid growing up, I had pictures of politicians on my wall instead of like supermodels and cars and all that. So politics was always something that I found interesting as well. Kids don't, and th this is a very blanket statement that I'm going to ask you here, or the blanket question I'm going to ask, but high school kids don't traditionally fall in love with politics in high school. Was it just you, or were there other people in your class, in your grade, that were also enjoying politics? Because I remember my grade 11, I was the only one who could actually name you all at that time, 23 prime ministers of Canada. <laughs> I agree. Like many of the people that do not take those elective classes such as politics and everything, they're not interested in politics at all. They don't even vote in the elections. I know so many people in high school that don't vote, even though they have the opportunity mm -hmm. to vote because they're 18, they don't choose to vote. Especially the election that happened right now, currently the federal election, I was in my first time voting and I was excited and I voted. And I asked a bunch of my friends, hey, did you guys vote? You know, are you guys interested about this election? And I got a bunch of no's and I don't know, I don't know if I want to vote or anything. And I think the problem is with that is that they have a distrust in the system. They're not, they don't trust the system. They don't think that it can bring change. So that's the issue right there. And a lot of people don't usually, like young people don't really like politics because obviously it seems boring to them. But in my opinion, it's, it's, it's a beacon of change. So where did the organization Youth in Politics come from? Because you, you graduate high school, you go off to the University of Toronto, and you find, found this, or did you found, uh, found the organization before you went into university? Explain to me how the Youth in Politics organization came about. 
Okay, that's a really great question. I get I get asked this all the time. <laughs> so uh, grade 12, uh, Mr. Carr's class again. Um, you know, I was interested in politics and I wanted to do my own podcast. So initially Youth in Politics was a podcast called the World Today Podcast. Um, so it was just me with my microphone uh, and uh, just recording from my bedroom. Uh, and I, for 20 minutes straight, I talked about politics, just random issues. And I told my friends the next day, hey, I'm thinking to start this thing. I started a podcast, go ahead, listen to it. And obviously I didn't get the support that I want. I was like expecting at first. I mean, people were like, Yo, what is this? This is pretty boring, man. And I was like, whoa, come on, give it a chance. And so obviously it took a bit of time to start up. I kept going and going. And season one was all about me just talking, um, pretty boring. Uh, and then season two was when I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to get guests on. And so I reached out and surprisingly, the first female prime minister of Canada, Kim Campbell, actually responded. And I got her on the show. And right when I got the former prime minister of Canada, I went to school the next day, people were like, oh my God, you were the kid that interviewed the prime minister. You were the kid. I'm like, what's the, what's the podcast about? I was surprised because, you know, a lot of people started to, rec started to recognize the podcast. And so uh, we kept doing it. We got Mark Holland, MP Mark Holland, who's the house leader right now in parliament. Uh, we had um, a bunch of MPs scheduled, but then the pandemic hit. And then we were like, okay, we can't get podcast guests on the podcast. What do we do now? And so that's when we decided to rebrand the entire podcast. And by that time, I actually got three, four of my friends to join the podcast team. So it was growing. Um, and then uh, we decided, you know what, we're going to change the entire podcast and rebrand it. And we called it Youth in Politics. And with that, we had interviews with politicians. We had our own podcast. So the podcast is called Voice Above. And then we also had journalists. So journalism is a really big part in, po in politics because I think politics and journalism go hand in hand with each other. And so journalism was a pretty big thing. And so obviously it was a trial and error thing because it was our first time getting to journalism. We had no help and we were doing it on our own. So we came up with, we had editors. And then by summer of 2020, we had, over 70 young people writing and working for youth in politics. And so those 70 people were not just from Canada. We decided to take this internationally. So there were, we had people from Montreal. We had people from uh, Alberta. We had people from America, Brazil, uh, let's see, India, United Kingdom. I think one of us was, one of them was from the Middle East, uh, one from Australia, a bunch of from like the, from South Asia. And it was, it was massive. 70 people working for youth in politics. Wow. Now, where did where did that come from? Like, because getting the word out in this sort of abundance of political news is quite hard. So how did you break away from the pack? Because getting people just in Canada to tune in or even take interest of your show or website is hard. So how were you able to get people in from Brazil, from Australia, from the, uh, the States to come in and write for your organization? That's a really great question. So what makes us unique is, is that Okay, for example, I'm going to give an example wise question answer. So you have these organizations, these organizations, they're very biased in terms of, okay, if you're a writer, you have to write in a right wing perspective of the issue. Um, and so a lot of people don't like that. What our organization is, it's just a platform. We as an organization don't have an opinion or a mindset or anything like that. We, we're just a platform. The writers in the organization express their opinions. So we have people that are right wing, left wing, central, and they write whatever they feel like writing. Obviously, it has to be within a standard, and we meet that standard. But they can write anything radical. Um, but people do have a lot of opinions they want to share out, and we give them that platform. And that really, you know, um, gives these writers a chance to write. And our writers are all young people. They're not, you know, high. They're not like university graduated or like thirty year olds. They're like young high school students, first year university students, and they want to get into the system, but they need a step forward. And so we provide them that opportunity and experience and get them involved. I've never felt so old in my life when you said they're not in their thirties. Wow. Oh my. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the reality check there. Um, but. I, I, I love that thinking. I love the thinking that you are, you give equal opportunity for all viewpoints, which is always needed. Um, politics has become very divided though. And journalism has become very divided. Like you said, there's right, there's left, there's uh, organizations who say you have to write this way because we're this organization. You have to write that way or this organization. Um, 
we are seeing the rise of a more divided country than we have ever seen. Are you concerned that because you are youth, and I, I say this uh, kind of uh, not as a, a slight, but kind of as an actual question, do you find that being youth in politics and youth in uh, journalism can be potentially detrimental because you are writing stuff, you're putting it out there, and people are then going to potentially attack you for being too right wing, too left wing, too over, like too far right, too far left, and you will be divided even though you try not to be. Well, I think it's more about freedom of speech. You know, if people division usually comes from oh, uh, we don't have our voices heard. Uh, you know, the, for example, uh, the, the protests are happening in Ottawa and Toronto. It's usually the freedom of speech uh, issue where people don't have the choice of choosing what they want, right? And so giving them a voice also shows the bright side. So like, for example, uh, Pierre Paulier, the person who's actually running for conservative leadership, um, he actually said like how, if you have a protest that's liberal type of protest, you don't see the media giving uh, you know, attacking each individual person. Oh, this person attended this event, and so it categorizes the whole pod. Uh, I mean, uh, protest as a radical protest. And so, what they do is that they attack those type of protests. So, what we do is we give them a different opinion and a different uh, perspective of the issue. I had a lot of people reach out to me. Hey, this is a really good thing that you're doing platform because what happens is I think uh, I notice a lot of people from the conservative mindset feel like their voices are often like. Um, ridiculed and uh, you know like oh you're such a you have such a bad opinion and everything and so it gives them a chance to actually share their opinion and you know give them a voice which they don't have now i before i should have asked this beforehand before we started but uh do you have a political leaning because uh, as much as we all try to be independent uh, as journalists uh, we always have to ask that question and anyone who's listened to my show whoever's watched my show before knows that i ran for the liberals in 2015 i have since then left the liberals my husband is a uh, former ndp mla for the province of alberta i have been a card carrying member of the wild rose party the progressive conservative party the liberal party the Alberta party, the rhinoceros party, the green party, because as a journalist, you take memberships out in all parties. So that way you can't <laughs> be accused of being biased. So I got to ask you, are, are, have you written things for the uh, youth and politics website that is leaning one way or the other? So as the CEO, I tend not to write for anything for youth and politics, just because it gets, because I am the head of the organization. I don't want to give out my opinions publicly, mm -hmm. but during my uh, time on uh, such as uh, CB24, when I was on the show, uh, or other interviews that I've been on, people do ask me those type of questions. And my, I'd say my mindset is usually around the NDP or the Liberals. Um, so I am a Liberal member. I, I, I do support the Liberal Party. Um, but I do have opinions such as, you know, we should, we should focus on a bit of both, you know, conservative mindset and liberal mindset. I think that, you know, we should look at um, our economy in a conservative mindset, especially with inflation and everything. I feel like um, we should, uh, with housing crisis, the Bank of Canada should have increased the interest rate instead of lowering the interest rate. Um, stuff like that is a conservative mindset. And uh, I don't feel like we should be injecting so much money to the economy because there's all, also like the problem with inflation. Because as an econ economist student studying economy in the University of Toronto, I learned that um, the importance of, uh, uh, importance of injecting uh, money into the economy and how it can actually affect the economy. Foreign aid, for example, when you give out foreign aid to an economy, you actually destroy markets, local markets in that economy, right? So stuff like that, uh, I tend to look at it from a more logical perspective. Um, it's and, a weird, uh, weird word you just said there, logical. Some people need to learn it in this country. If I don't, if you don't, if I, I can say that because this is my show, but that's me just saying that <laughs> as an editorial statement there. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I, I, I do want to say that 
I, I had had the pleasure to look at your Facebook page, the Youth and Politics Facebook page and the YouTube channel and also your website. And I, I noticed that you have had not just liberal MPs, you've had conservative MPs as well. You talked about the former Prime Minister of Canada, Kim Campbell. You talk, uh, You also spoke to, I, I'm going to get the name of the writing here wrong, but Perry Sound Muskoka, uh, Scott uh, something or other. He was on your show as well. Right. Uh, yeah. Mark, Mark Holland was on your show. Um, we are seeing a, a surge of youth being coming these independent reporters. Uh, I talk about y- yourself. Uh, there's another gentleman from Ontario. I forget his name right now who does small clips of interviews with uh, politicians. Is that how you attract youth to politics is taking a youth perspective and talking to politicians because I have talked about youth and politics all my life. And I can tell you as a old guy, like you've just called me a 30 something year old, it's hard <laughs> to talk about youth and politics because I'm not a youth. So for you is, is taking the youth perspective and interviewing politicians, a unique way of getting the, the politicians to talk about youth and politics. Uh, right. Uh, for example, I feel like young people, they feel like the politicians don't hear them out, you know, and us sitting down with politicians shows that, hey, the politicians are here sitting down with us and actually listening to our concerns. You know, we just have to give them that chance. You know, we just have to show that we are actually listening and that we actually they actually listen to us, you know. And so us interviewing these MPs and prime ministers shows that they care about us. If they didn't care about us, they wouldn't have given us a chance to even interview them. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's an 18 year old high school kid. Why would I, why would I waste my time? But that's not the case here. They want to hear opinions. They want to hear our questions and answer them. And so that's like a, you know, incentive for young people to be involved. Okay, you know, my voice is being heard. I see this young person now you're interviewing this politician. My voice is being heard. I'm gonna ask the, the poignant question again. Do you actually think they're being heard? Or do you think they're just giving you airtime? And I, I, I mean that in all respect, because I, I have people on my show. I'm like, okay, you just came on my show to get your message out. And that's about it. Are you actually being heard? Do you find? I feel like um, sometimes there is a chance. There is a case where you feel like you're not, your voice is not being heard, but you know, you, you uh, that's a very tough question. You know, I, 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 I you, you often don't know if your voice is being heard, but if you look at policies, for example, climate change and everything and the stuff, the message that you want. Okay, for example, Greta Thunberg, that huge protest that happened in Montreal, you can see the changes that are being made. Politicians now more than ever are focusing on climate change than they were in the 2000, early 2000s. You know? That shows that this is a concern. Because for example, to be frank, the politicians that are right now 50 year olds, 40 year olds right now in parliament, they're not gonna be alive um, when we're 50 or like 70 or something, facing the climate, the effects of climate change, why would, why would it matter to them? But it does matter. The fact that they're making those policies, because it does matter, because our voices are being heard, because they know that we didn't need the votes. They know that they need to make changes happen because they have grandchildren, they have kids of their own. They have, they have, they have, they, they worry about them. They worry about the future generation. And so from looking at that perspective, I feel like the voices are being heard. You, you spoke at the beginning of the interview about how uh, youth don't feel like they have a voice. And when youth in politics, the organization, you're giving them the voice. You're giving the voice of a generation that is often, often looked over, especially when it comes to politicians during elections, because you you go for the people who you know are going to vote and you don't go for the people who potentially are going to vote. How do we get more youth involved in politics? Because I hear from time to time from politicians and from uh, like campaigns of pol- political parties that we want to go after the political youth. We want to go after those who are engaged. But the issue is they don't go out and vote. They'll, they'll come out to rallies. They'll support the candidates that they want, but they won't come out and vote. How do we change that? And how do we get more youth involved in politics today? Because like you said, they are the next generation of voters. They are coming up to vote here soon. So how do we get them more involved today? So when they get to go out and vote for the first time, like you did in the last election, they actually do it. <laughs> it's simple. Incentives. How, Let me give you, you an mean? example. Let me go give you an it. example. Okay. So for example, um, people were supporting, hey man, I wanna, I wanna support climate change. I wanna support electrical, electrical cars. I want to I make my house more uh, economically friendly and everything and stuff like that, right? 
but they didn't really go out and purchase stuff like that. For example, until Tesla came out and the government started offering incentives of $10,000, $5,000. When incentives are offered, humans are usually intended to like, humans have this, uh, you know, this feeling, okay, you know what, if there's like an incentive and discount $5,000, $10,000 from the government, they go out and purchase that vehicle. Now you can see how Tesla sales have risen because of these incentives. Just like that, we need incentives for the youth. We need policies directly affecting the youth. For example, loans. Right now, as a student, right now, University of Toronto, I can see the effects of my loans right now. I can see how OSAP is low right now. My grants are not as high as I wanted to be before the Ford government. You know, stuff like that. If we offer incentives for young people, such as, hey, you know, uh, vote for me in this election and I'll make sure that your grants as high as ever before. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of student loans. We'll, we'll make education, uh, you know, free, stuff like that. Um, obviously, can this, th- these are incentives for you, young people, right? Getting involved or for example, trades because people who are voting are 18 year olds, they're going to university, right? And they want, they want, they want to have like free education. They, they don't want to pay $40,000 at the end of the university for loans and everything, right? And so if we can give them incentives such as education or, you know, stuff like jobs uh, in, within the government. So th- th- there is actually an incentive. Uh, I think it's, it's from the federal government, post-secondary education, right? Yeah. During your post-secondary education, you get into jobs fields within the government. You either work in the agriculture field, foreign affairs, stuff like that. The government gives you a job helps you get involved in those stuff. And so if, if we can focus and more, put more funding towards these systems and these uh, programs, and I feel like the youth would want to vote for that particular politician and that would get them involved in politics. Do you see party politicians? And let's, let's just, let's focus on Ontario because they're coming up with a federal, they're coming up with a provincial election here in June. Doug Ford, Andrew Horvath and Stephen Del Duca and Mike Schreiner, if I'm not mistaken, is his last name, will be going head to head in the next, this next election uh, to be- potentially become the new government of Ontario or the reelected government of Ontario. In the last four years, have you seen a shift from not focusing on uh, youth in politics to focusing on youth in politics? Because I remember as a staffer at Queen's Park, I don't remember talking about youth in politics because it was just not an issue that we wanted to talk about. We wanted to talk about social security and uh, Medicare and health care. Do you see a move from the parties, even just even one or two MLA MPPs talking about youth in politics now? I definitely do. For example, uh, if you know uh, the cuts that Ford government made to the education system, you've seen a lot of student protests that were happening. Students were realizing the cuts they were made. They were seeing the effects in the classroom. I was seeing the effects in the classroom. I was seeing more students in the classroom. I was seeing how we were going on strikes and everything. That has an effect on our education, right? And so student real, students realize that the government and the policies they make affect our education. And so when they're going out to protest and everything, they're actually being involved in the political system because protesting is part of the, is part of the is part of politics, you know, because protesting actually does make change happen. So just showing that they're protesting in large number of students, it's very likely for them to get involved in this election and vote and make change happen. Because they don't obviously as a student, they don't want cuts for their education. So obviously then they're gonna vote for a government that doesn't cut their education. So what is your organization, Youth in Politics, going to do to lead up to this next provincial election in Ontario? Because you have to remember, in Ontario, you have a provincial election in June. And then in October, if, for those who really are political nerds like I am, you have municipal elections as well that are going to be coming yes. out. So all the cities and all the townships and all the municipalities are going to be voting. So how are you leading up to these elections with your organization to ensure youth get involved, but also the politicians? actually answer questions that youth want to hear? That's a great question. Uh, For example, podcasts, you know, talking consistently about the issues that we're facing. Um, For example, the podcast you're doing right now, it's a great way for people to listen. And, you know, for example, if you're just going for a walk or, you know, even for like a small jog or something, you want to listen to something, you know, do you have like that on board? Let me give me, let me give something a listen, right? And so people listening to us talking right now, that gives them interested in that, that makes them want to understand more about the issue, right? And so, for example, the provincial election, what our organization would do particularly is talk more about education cuts, talk more about stuff like in our podcast, how 
those type of cuts affect us. But we're, we're this time we're not focusing on interviewing part of the podcast. We're not talking. We're not focusing on talking with politicians, rather than university students um, and professors, because they give a more academic perspective of things. Politicians are there, you know, giving their agenda out, like, hey, you know what, our party is going to do this, our party. But there's no real answer to that question. Yeah. And I noticed that from politicians a lot. Professors, they don't have, they're not running for election or anything. They, they're just you're talking about logical things. Like I said, logical things from a logical perspective. So that's what we're focusing on right now, interviewing fourth year university students who have experience in, for example, inflation. Our second episode is coming out for the season two on February 15th. That episode is on the housing crisis. We have a student fourth year who's studying metrics and she, our host Kate, interviewed that person uh, for the podcast. And so if we interview students on students and professors, that actually shows that, you know, students are discussing and this is a hot topic going on and, you know, people would end up voting. Now, are you in conversation with other universities and colleges throughout the uh, Canada? Well, even in just Ontario, let's just stick with Ontario for a bit here and having that discussion of how can we work together to work as a sort of post-secondary group to make sure our issues are on the table? Because I'm assuming, because I, I live in the real world as much as everyone else does, your issues are going to be completely different from your you your vice CEO, your co, uh, your uh, CEO, deputy CEO, or any of the other journalists who are in your organization. So how do you cohesively get a message out about getting youth in politics and making sure your issues are addressed by politicians when you have so many different views? And are you working with other organizations to ensure those views are being heard? So the main purpose is not actually to, for example, to get the Liberal Party elected or the Progressive Conservative elected. It's more about getting involved in the election system itself, actually uh, going out and vote. Okay, I misunderstood that. I apologize. So no matter how many people, uh, how different opinions you are, the, at the end of the day, you should just go out and vote for that person you want to get elected. So, for example, if the Conservative Party has the policies you want to be implemented, that's why we give. That's why we give our uh, we're a platform with multiple opinions. So we actually give the uh, Conservative side of things, the Liberal side of things, and people actually read those articles. And hey, you know, at the end of the day, I want to choose the Conservative. Hey, at the end of the day, I want to choose the Liberals. Our main thing is just to go out and get them voted. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. The, now, what's the your people what's your follow. metrics for success? What's your metrics for success to ensure that, like, putting this stuff out there is a daunting task. It's a lot of hard work. What's your metrics of success? Do you have people come back and say, "Thank you for letting me know this uh, because of your uh, article on this, this, and this"? I was able to make an informed decision. What are the metrics that you put in place to make sure that you a get youth involved in politics, but b you continue that conversation with that youth are having that they can like get the information that they need from your your organization and get out and make an informed decision what's those metrics so we wanted to see we actually wanted to see if we're making a difference or not so what we did with the 70 members that were involved in youth politics around 50 of them so some some 70 50 of them were actually young people in canada itself now what we did was we asked them we did a survey within the organization and asked them have they voted or 50 percent of them never voted uh, 70, I think uh, 25% of them were maybe not voted, voting, I don't know if I'm going to vote or something, 25% did vote. So uh, we did the survey again when the federal election happened again. We actually ended up getting 75% actually voted. So we wow. showed that the people that actually, you know, getting them involved actually does make a difference. And that if we keep doing this and adding more and more young people within the organization, that actually gets them going and in, involved in politics. Um, I want to turn to the future now because we, we've talked about the Ontario election, but what's in store next for the organization Youth in Politics? Because I, I always try to go bigger and better on my show. I always try to go bigger. I always try to get new things and try new things out just to see if they work. What's in store for 2022 besides the elections, besides getting Youth in Politics for the Youth in Politics organization? So we have multiple goals in place. First of all, we want to interview the Prime Minister of Canada. We're trying to get to him. Um, we're trying to go in person and interview him, but with this 
pandemic going on, we want to do an in-person interview. It's much more better. We want to see the prime minister and we actually want to have a conversation with them behind the scenes, behind the camera, and actually talk to them about, hey, how are we going to get young people involved? And so uh, not even that, before um, we had a conversation with the former federal transportation minister and our partnership with the Bay Observer. So they were friends and they actually got us talking back in the end of 2020, but he's really busy right now because he's also the president of some transportation company or something down in Hamilton. And so um, basically we were coming up with the talk of having a youth panel and from all across Canada, because there, is there isn't an actual youth panel except for CC, that's one of the youth panels. But we wanted to come up with a youth panel where young people from Canada, every episode is a different it's a young person from Canada that gets to share their opinions and talk about a certain issue. And that gets them going and going. And it's, it's a huge, we were coming up with a huge young panel, but that came to a pause. So 2022, we want to get back on that. We want to try to get that done. And we actually wanted to do a partnership with the federal government. So this is a federal government sponsored program, which actually gets young people involved. And so that's what we're focusing on right now. And what about for yourself? What, what's on your agenda? Because if you look at the Youth and Politics website, you are an aspiring politician. So I think anyone who know, who can read knows that. Um, so what's what about for you? What's on your agenda to, to ensure that while you try to get other youth involved, you get involved as well? Right, that's a great question. I was actually running for the Liberal Party of Ontario for the provincial election for my writing in Ajax. Uh, but what happened, unfortunately, was they made the writing um, a female-only writing because of their new uh, program. They're trying to implement more females within the party. And so I decided, you know, you know what, um, maybe next year or I'm going to run for municipal elections that are coming up. Oh, wow. So that would be an Ajax. I, I know Ajax quite well. I, I'm from the Clarington area, so I know it quite well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Ajax, yeah. So for those who want to get involved in the organization, reach out to you and potentially learn a little bit more because we can talk about as much stuff as we want in the half hour, 40 minutes that we have, but there are probably, there's probably that one question that I did not ask and that one person yelling at their screen, they're typing figuriously on YouTube or they're yelling at their car stereo or are yelling while walking their dog listening to this. How can people get involved? How can people learn more about your organization? Simple. So go ahead, check us out on Instagram, youth and politics underscore, uh, or, you know, check out our website, www.youthinpolitics.net and give us an email at info at youth and politics. Um, and, uh, you know, you can hear back from us within a week and we will answer your question. And if you want to get involved, uh, being a journalist or even being part of the podcast team, we'll always have opportunities available for you all. And so just give us an email and we'll, uh, we'll look for something that you can be involved with in the organization. Awesome. Uh, Zabir, Zabir, sorry, I apologize. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, as I said at the beginning of this, um, I've always, youth in politics is a must. We need, because they are the, they are the voters, they are our next generation of leaders, and we need them to be take step up and take a sort of the mantelpiece to be better prepared. So when they, like yourself, run for politics, they know what to, what the issues are. So I thank you for starting this organization, founding this organization, but also talking about this issue because we need more politicians talking about youth and politics. And I think without organizations like yours, it's not going to happen. So thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Chris. No worries. So for anyone who's listened to the show before or followed the show via YouTube, you know what I'm about to say next. If you want to learn more about the Youth and Politics organization, scroll down. Like literally scroll down. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, yes, we're still there. If you want to send your negative hate mail, send it to me. I'll file it away at the appropriate location. Um, send, uh, scroll back, scroll down. There it is. There's the information at the below. The links to the website, Instagram, and email will be in the show notes below. So check it out. Because I highly recommend it. If you know a youth in politics who has an interest in politics, get in touch because this is a great organization and we need more youth in politics. So without further ado, I want to thank everyone for listening to another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember guys, just keep talking, have a conversation, just get out from social media and just talk to one of each other. Thanks so much guys. Thank you.